Okay, our next speaker now is uh, Sean Hoban from the Morton Arboretum in the USA. He's going to talk about uh, conserving genetic diversity in bot bot botanic gardens. Hi, good morning everyone, thank you. Uh, Sean Hoban from the Morton Arboretum. For the past few years, I've been working at an arboretum, so I'm very interested in how we can do better ex situ collection, how we can better build and manage our ex situ collections for conserving genetic diversity. Our challenge is to get a representative sample from across the species native distribution, encompassing its trait, ecological, and genetic diversity. This will, in the future, as my colleagues at Chicago Botanic Garden have said, give us lots of options for conservation and management into the future. We have to balance efficiency, so that's using our limited time, energy, and space in our collections with effectiveness, because if we lose important genes, they may be lost forever. People started working on this question back in the 1970s, uh, especially for crop collections. The challenge was that uh, the traditional varieties and land races that people had been growing for hundreds of years were disappearing due to industrial agriculture. So seed banks wanted to capture these locally adapted uh, populations and, and varieties in seed banks. And they recognized that there were limits to how much we can keep in seed banks. They used simple equations like this one to calculate how big of a sample size is needed to capture alleles at a given frequency with a given probability. And they ended up with a guideline of about 50 samples to capture alleles greater than 5% frequency with a 95% probability. This was later revisited by other authors to calculate how many populations for rare species and common species to collect from. The main point I want to make is that this simple equation was applied to all species. So basically that assumes that all species have approximately the same distribution of allele frequencies, amount of genetic diversity, and genetic structure. But as all of our presentations at this conference and, and for decades of work have shown that traits Biological traits of species influence the distribution of genetic diversity over space and among populations. So seed dispersal, pollination, size, longevity, geographic range, structure, fragmentation, all of these influence how genetic diversity is distributed among populations, and therefore how a seed collection strategy that goes to different populations should be expected to capture that genetic diversity. So my previous work, which some of you saw in a presentation in Bordeaux a few years ago, I showed that uh, using simulated species, so modeled species, these traits do in fact determine the collection size. So some species, especially those that are selfing um, or have low seed dispersal, we have to collect a lot more samples for our seed banks than other species, so up to five times as much seed. So what have I been doing since? Well, that's what I'll tell you now. So I'll answer five questions for you today, four questions for you today. How much have we conserved in botanic gardens today of our rare species? How many plants should we be keeping in our gardens? How much better could we do? And then at the end, I'll revisit what are we doing for conservation anyways? The project I'll tell you about was uh, actually 11 uh, rare species across five genera. It involved over 20 collaborators, three years of work. Uh, funded by the Institute for Museum and Library Services in the US and led by Montgomery Botanical Center in Florida. So how do we calculate how much genetic diversity is in our gardens? First we need a reference. We go to the wild populations. We collect tissue from plants in all the wild populations we know of, trying to get as much as possible. These are rare species, so we can do that. Then we go to our gardens. This is our greenhouse at the Morton Arboretum. We collect tissue from actually botanic gardens around the world. And then we compare these two. We say what alleles are present in the wild and which ones are actually captured in the plants in the botanic garden. This involved a lot of work and a lot of collaboration among botanic gardens, which are very generous in sharing their time and, and effort to help us with this project. But I will tell you right to the results. 
These are 11 species, grouped by genus. That's how many samples exist in botanic gardens of these rare species. Some rare species we keep in the hundreds of individuals, similar to rare species in zoos, while other species we have very few individuals in botanic gardens. This is how much genetic diversity, measured at microsatellite loci, is conserved of these species in botanic gardens today. So there are a few species where we have close to 100% of the alleles in botanic gardens, but there are other species where we have closer to 50% of the genetic diversity in botanic gardens. So some species are doing very well, some species not well at all. If you take these two axes, number of samples, percent genetic diversity, it's a very nice relationship. The more samples, on average, you keep in botanic gardens, the more genetic diversity you get. We expect this. But I want to show you a couple of cases. This, in, this species, more than twice the number of samples as this species, but actually less genetic diversity. Here, more than twice the number of samples as this species, but less genetic diversity. And this species, the same number of samples, but this one has twice, more than twice as much genetic diversity. So this shows us that perhaps we can work a little bit on the design of our collections to improve them. Which is the next question I want to talk about. Can we develop an optimal strategy? So what I showed you was what we have collected now. What I'll now talk about is if we could redesign our collections from the start, how much genetic diversity could we get, and how many samples should we keep? So how do we do this? We can take our wild populations, shown here as a picture. These are the, the each tree we have a genetic diversity uh, for from the wild. We just resample them for different numbers. Every time we resample the wild population, we calculate how much genetic diversity is captured in that resample. Okay, and we record that. We'll then plot that. So we've resampled from one up to the total size of the population, and we'll get a curve like this showing how much an optimal sampling would capture from the wild population. So we do that for all 11 species, shown here, colored by genus, and you see they don't overlap. If there was one optimal strategy for all species, they would all pretty much overlap, but they don't, and even within a genus, there's a lot of variation among the uh, species within a genus, except possibly for Quercus, they all clump together. This is the minimum optimal size to get 95% of the alleles. With a small caveat, we dropped all the singletons and doubletons, and we can talk about that later, later if you want. Um, the range between the minimum species and the species needing the most samples is about a factor of three, a little over three, close to three and a half actually, which is very much within the range of the modeling work that I had done previously. So this shows, this reinforces the modeling work, with real data, we've shown that there's wide variation in minimal sample size among species, and it's not perfectly related to the genus, which we might expect, because species within a genus share a lot of traits. So we should design sampling strategies targeted to specific species, but genus is not a great proxy for that design. Okay, could we do better? So. Just one example, this is a Quercus species from Alabama in the United States. Our uh, current collections, we have 77 individuals from about 15 botanic gardens around the world. That captures 70% of the genetic diversity. If we could go back and redo our collection, redo our seed collection to bring it into botanic gardens with a better sampling design, we could capture up to 94% of the genetic diversity. So there's actually a large gap between what we have in our ex situ collections and what we could have with perhaps improved sampling design. So um, in this case, it's about 1.35 uh, times as much genetic diversity we could get with a, a better sampling, even in the same sample size, okay? We do that across all our species, and it's about 1.4 times as much genetic diversity we could be keeping in our botanic gardens with better sampling design. Alternatively, we could reduce the size of our collections. In some cases, we might have too large of a collection. So this is one of our largest collections. And uh, so uh, we currently have 244 individuals. 
an optimal design to get the same amount of genetic diversity could be reduced down to 44, so that's a factor of six that we could reduce the collection size. Across all our species, it's about three and a half times that we could potentially reduce our collection size and still get the same genetic diversity. So there's two options we could um, uh, increase the amount of genetic diversity or reduce the collection size uh, without any change in the effort we put towards conservation. But of course, optimal sampling is really hard. Um, but uh, hopefully these results will motivate seed collectors to be thinking about visiting all the populations and getting as much uh, representative sample as possible. Uh, the seed collector does not have to choose just one sample design. They can choose from several options. This is from a different study. But you can choose between visiting a few populations with lots of trees per population, or lots of populations with few trees per populations, and reach the same genetic goal. So now I want to come to uh, the philosophy of conservation. What are we trying to conserve anyways? It's not actually just a uh, question for thought. I'm going to show you why this is a really important thing to solve uh, to do better conservation. The question is, uh, there's two questions I pose. Uh, do we need every rare allele? To get every allele that exists, even for rare species, much, even much more harder for common species, but for rare species, it's going to take two to ten times as much effort to get 100% of the alleles as it would take to get 90 to 95%. So that's a huge effort. Do we need every allele? In addition, everything I've showed you up to this point assumes that the goal is to get one copy of every allele. But disaster happens. This is a fire at a botanic garden in California. This is a hurricane at a botanic garden in Florida. And this is uh, ash dying uh, in our gardens uh, in Chicago. So trees die in our collections. Seeds fail to germinate. So maybe we want to have a goal to get more than one copy of every allele. Is that five copies we want? Is that 10 copies? Is it 50 copies? I don't know, but we can calculate how much more to collect to get more than one copy. So why does this matter? I'm going to show you in this chart the range of seed, optimal seed collections for a given type of, of uh, genetic diversity. So these are harder to capture alleles over here. And this is number of copies. OK, this is the range you would want to collect to get each of these boxes. Uh, why is that important? If we focus on one box, this is the range due to all the biology I talked to about in the first part of the talk, the species traits, seed dispersal, range fragmentation. Here it's a factor of two. It might range to, like I said before, between a factor of two and five, just due to the biology of this species. This is the range due to our decisions about what philosophy we want for conservation. It's a factor of 64 from here to here based on what kind of genetic diversity and how many copies we need to avoid disaster or loss of our collections. So that's a really big impact, uh, a factor of 64 of how much to include in our collections. Much more impact than biology, actually. So I think we can answer this. We can quantify the frequency of disasters. We can look at the uh, amount of death in our gardens or failure to germinate in our seed collections. And we can get at the number, I think, of duplicates we want in our seed collections or botanic gardens. I don't know how much uh, rare variants we need for a species to evolve in the long term. Of course, it will always be case dependent. But is there some general rule or range we could come up with that would apply to most species. I'd really like to solve that problem. In the future, a few things to work on. As a botanic garden, we're not just interested in uh, genetic diversity conservation. We're also optimizing across phylogenetic diversity. Many species we're keeping. Uh, also, how does genetic diversity correlate to geographic diversity, and can we use that as a proxy as we design our seed collections? What kind of traits? and also rare species do we keep in our gardens. So we're trying to optimize across four different genera at our arboretum. Considering genetic diversity and many other goals, how do we design a whole arboretum collection? Moving beyond that, we're looking at how do we coordinate among botanic gardens into the future? How do we share 
similar to zoos, have shared material for breeding and reintroduction. Can we do that with botanic gardens? So I want to thank many people who have been involved in my group over the years. The people who funded uh, all of my work, but this project was funded by Nimbus, and again by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, primarily. Now I'll run through the results and leave them up here for you to, to ponder. How much have we conserved for these 11 rare species, which I think are good case studies. So these are species we put a lot of effort into. Most species we're probably preserving at a lesser degree than these in botanic gardens. So for our work, it was 40 to 95%. Uh, how much uh, should we sample? It does differ by species by about a factor of four. So we can optimize the genetic diversity uh, collection of particular species. Could we do better? I showed that yes, we could, with more optimal or random sampling of wild populations. We can identify strategies um, tailored to specific uh, seed collectors' needs, such as, uh, or, or geographic limitations, political limitations, logistical limitations, and uh, decisions about what we need to conserve in our botanic gardens the philosophy of conservation is actually incredibly important. And uh, so I think there's a lot to work on into the future and happy to answer questions or, or talk about future efforts. Um, I hope I've shown you that we can use data and models uh, to optimize how we conserve genetic diversity ex situ for the future. So here, there is a question. Um, hello, interesting presentation. Um, my question is, have you tried to link your genetically your, your the different all trees within each species into a sort of network, trying to find out what was the initial source of the sort of spreading through the botanical gardens and so on? Yep, that's, uh, that is uh, the next step to work on. So uh, these species were collected over a long period of time, each one by different collectors on different collecting trips. They each had different strategies. So yes, the next thing to do is to go case by case to look at how many collections were made, how many trees did these people visit, um, and how did that change over time? Can we actually plot an increase in genetic diversity over time in our collections? That's a, a good future effort, yes. Uh, thanks, John, for this very nice presentation. I have two short questions. The first is that I understand you've done your simulations and your calculations based on the microsatellites. So any, any feeling if you have used SNPs, for instance, uh, what that would show? And my second short question is, what, is what, can, how, what can you say about this optimal random sampling? <laughs> thanks. Uh, okay, so would this results apply to SNPs? I actually think so. We used uh, microsatellites, uh, partly so we could get at really rare alleles. In total, this project is about 3,300 samples, so it would have been pretty expensive to do at RADSEQ or, or another large uh, uh, technique. Um, and we had microsats for all the species. So we could get at pretty rare alleles. Um, I think the results will hold for SNPs. Um, uh, it's, you might get a finer, you know, uh, detail, but for each species we had 10 to 15 microsatellites and, and actually you know dozens of alleles per species, so I think it's pretty representative. Uh, as for optimal random sampling, that means we visit each population that exists, so there's two to ten populations for these rare species. Um, we visit every one and we take an equal amount of uh, trees or, or samples per population. Um, it might not be optimal, you could actually and my other work has shown you can identify the most important populations, those that might actually be most effective to sample. Uh, this was actually perfectly random sampling. Yeah. Hello, Leopoldo from uh, INRAI. Um, how static these collections uh, have to be in terms of, uh, well, uh, keeping pace with uh, what's going on uh, in nature? Uh, do you, yeah. Can you repeat? How static these uh, collections uh, have to be? Um, do, you, do we need to go back to the field and uh, collect more? That is a good question for the, to work on. Uh, these are all relatively long-lived, so they're living between probably two, t t between 20 and, and 200 years, depending on the species. So I don't think we've seen a lot of change yet 
But I think in the coming decades, especially for the palms, uh, which are relatively short-lived, 20 to 30 years, um, in the wild there, there will be some genetic changes. And so some recommendations are to go back every, uh, at least every one to two generations. So depending on the species, that would be between every 20 and maybe 100 or, or even longer years. Um, because they are small populations, I'm not sure if they're adapting, but there will be some genetic changes. Uh, Tanya Piharvi from University of Oulu. So I wanted to ask about this um, kind of also on the philosophical end of the of the of your questions. Like that, I assume that the mi microsatellite alleles are not the ones that you want to conserve, but the overall genetic diversity. So how well do you think that the number of alleles or um, or number of rare alleles that you catch is actually reflecting what you want to catch? And um, because until you sample, and if there are a lot of these rare alleles, until you sample all the individuals, you're going to miss some rare alleles, <laughs> right? So uh, Yes, precisely. So um, it's the best proxy I can think of for now. Um, I mean, I guess what we really want is, uh, of course, trait diversity. So ideally, we'd be measuring traits uh, in the wild populations. Um, I think that's an important thing to work on in the future. I'd like to see how much these microsatellite alleles correspond to SNPs, like Phil said, but also to the traits that we're wanting to conserve. Um, we are considering using geography and, and ecography as a, as a proxy, but I think it would be great to collaborate with um, quantitative geneticists and, and work on the traits, because that's really what we want to conserve, I think. But we can talk more at coffee if you have ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.